Hello, I'm Natalie, and I'm here today to tell you an interesting story about endometriosis in science and in the media. So this is a story about synchronicity, about ethics, and about women's health. So as you know, if you've watched some of my videos, I've been studying endometriosis for a couple of years. If you don't know what that is, it's a reproductive disease that affects women, and it's when tissue um, of the endometrium or tissue similar to that um, is present outside of the uterus and it grows and proliferates into painful lesions. So this condition is, can be very serious. It can also manifest in a mild way, um, but it can be extremely painful and debilitating to women and it affects up to 10% of women and may becoming um, even more common. So this is a serious disease and it deserves serious research attention. And that is, I believe, at the crux of this controversy I'm gonna share with you today. So depending on what kind of media you consume, you may or may not have come across this news article in the past few months. I think it was about three months ago. So here's the headline you can see here. Disgusting study rating attractiveness of women with endometriosis retracted by medical journal. So let's back up a little bit. So seven years ago, which is also about the same amount of time it takes for women with endometriosis to receive the correct diagnosis. So seven years ago, a study by Paolo Versolini and several of his colleagues based out of Italy published a study in Fertility and Sterility, which is a widely read journal about reproductive health, generally speaking. They published a study where they assessed women with endometriosis, a severe form, um, women without the disease and women with milder forms of the disease on several different variables. Some of these were body measurements, such as the ratio between your waist and your hips, um, the ratio between the breast and the waist, uh, questions such as when did you start having sexual intercourse, and then the participants were also rated um, for physical attractiveness. So two female doctors and two male doctors who didn't know whether or not the women had endometriosis um, rated them as not attractive, mildly attractive, very attractive in kind of a casual setting. And so um, to a regular person or to a woman with endometriosis, this comes across as shocking. First, it's shocking to people that this was seen as an important topic to study. Here we have women suffering from this really difficult disease that doesn't have a cure, that's difficult to treat, that comes back after it's treated, that's difficult to be taken seriously. Lots of times women go to the doctor complaining of severe pain and suffering and they, were, they feel like they're not taken seriously, they're told to take more Tylenol, etc. So, um, you know, why would scientists who have a, a big background in studying endometriosis from different perspectives, why would they take the time to study, you know, if women with this disease are hotter than women without it? So perhaps you can see why women in the community of endometriosis support and activism were particularly offended by this. And in my opinion, the article itself didn't do a great job at explaining the theoretical background leading to that hypothesis. And the hypothesis was that women with endometriosis or more severe forms would be more physically attractive than women without it. And the findings did support that hypothesis. So why on earth would someone come to that hypothesis in the first place? And I think that only plays a small role in the reaction that the paper got, but I think it would have helped um, lay people all sorts of people to understand, you know, where is the logic leading to this? And so the research group has written about this in other papers. It just wasn't uh, highlighted in a lot of detail in this paper. So what we know from many different studies on endometriosis is that women with the disease um, appear to demonstrate sets of physical characteristics that are consistent. One of these is lower body mass index. So women with endometriosis tend to be um, have lower body mass index than women without the disease. Um, another one, though this study didn't find that, but several studies have, 
is lower waist to hip ratio. So the waist is narrower relative to the hips. And this goes along with um, the observation that women with endometriosis tend to have more fat deposits on the hips and butt and less on the abdomen. And that is a more female typical pattern of fat distribution. So testosterone um, promotes the deposit of fat more on the belly. And women, of course, on average are lower in testosterone and higher levels of estrogen relative to testosterone promote more fat deposits on the hip thighs and butt. And that fat is really important in reproduction. And also the lower waist to hip ratio, um, more female typical fat deposits are cross-culturally seen as more attractive by males when they're observing females. But again, why is it relevant or important at all to study attractiveness? So attractiveness has quite a history of being an object of study, particularly in fields like evolutionary psychology or even behavioral ecology, where people are studying animal behavior. So if you come from more of a social science background, you may think of attractiveness as something that's socially constructed, that depends on the culture you're studying. But people who study comparative biology, people who study cross-cultural human behavior, um, we know that attractiveness is fairly consistent. Of course, there's cultural differences, but in general, um, women demonstrating certain features are preferred as mates over women um, who do not demonstrate those features. Waist to hip ratio is one of those, and of course, facial attractiveness is one as well. So in evolution, we understand that attractiveness is actually a, what we call an honest signal to some extent, in that it signals health and it signals aspects of fertility or reproductive value. So for example, a study has found that women with lower waist to hip ratios tend to have higher levels of circulating estrogen and higher levels of circulating estrogen predict the likelihood that you will conceive within a given menstrual cycle. So it's not that attractiveness is this kind of separate disjointed variable. It has important relationships to fertility. And of course, endometriosis is a condition that can affect women's fertility. So that might seem a bit paradoxical, but we'll get to that later today or in another video. So these researchers knew that other studies had found these sets of phenotypes or physical characteristics that were associated with endometriosis. But they didn't go into a lot of detail as to why those might be present. And so now I'm just going to take us in a slightly different direction in terms of kind of how I stumbled upon this area. So all year I've been working on a paper that contrasts characteristics of women with endometriosis with characteristics of women with PCOS. And really generally speaking, PCOS is a condition associated with high testosterone and endometriosis is a condition associated with high levels of estrogen, at least in the, in the pelvic area. And an important part of understanding PCOS is actually the prenatal environment. So women with PCOS were more likely to have been exposed to high levels of testosterone when they were growing in their mother's body. And we know this from animal studies and a variety of other lines of research as well. Um, and a few different studies have um, suggested that the prenatal environment is important in endometriosis as well. But that area of research um, it's not as clearly understood as PCOS. So that was one of my goals was to explore how um, the prenatal hormonal environment might increase endometriosis risk. And estrogen has been looked at a lot, especially in the context of endocrine disruptors. So we know that certain kinds of chemicals that disturb your hormonal function, say if a mother was on one of those hormo um, artificial hormones, there's one called DES, which was given to women, I believe, in the 70s to prevent miscarriage. And it's a really um, powerful synthetic estrogen. So if girls were exposed to that when they were growing in their mother's body, um, as adults, they were much more likely to have endometriosis. Um, so um, as I was working on this research project, I was contrasting these different hormonal and other variables between endometriosis and PCOS. And one variable 
that researchers use across animals, including humans, to assess hormonal factors in the womb environment is something called anogenital distance. And it's pretty much what it sounds like. It's the distance between the anus and the genitals. Um, and that distance is impacted by exposure to testosterone and the, the ratio of testosterone and estrogen in utero. Because as the embryo is developing, um, the reproductive system is developing, um, the genitals are developing, and they all kind of start from this close area and then they migrate um, along a vertical axis. And the higher amount of testosterone that an embryo is exposed to in utero, um, that predicts more migration and a longer distance. So males have a much longer distance between their genitalia and their anus than females do. But within females, you see a lot of variation. And a few studies have found that women with PCOS, as expected from other research, they show a longer anogenital distance than women without PCOS, um, confirming what we know that women with that disease are exposed to higher levels of testosterone when they're developing in their mother's body. And interestingly, a few studies just came out in the last few years that found women with endometriosis have a shorter anogenital distance relative to women without the disease. And it's not just a little bit shorter or just a few women have it. The findings were quite substantial. So I think in one study they found that um, something like 90% of women with endometriosis had an anogenital distance below the median of the control group. So that's a really big effect size. And interestingly, when people reported that finding, they interpreted it in the context of estrogen. So okay, this kind of confirms the idea that this condition is one of high estrogen, which we know is true. But generally, when we study anogenital distance, um, we use it as a proxy of prenatal testosterone exposure. So those studies on endometriosis and anogenital distance um, suggest that women with endometriosis were actually exposed to very low levels of testosterone in utero. And that is a novel way of looking at the condition, that low levels of testosterone might actually increase the risk of this disease through um, changing the way that the whole hypothalamus, um, pituitary, and gonads, how they develop, how they produce hormones, and how they respond to hormones. But what does this have to do with attractiveness? And in, um, yeah, that's the question. What does this have to do with attractiveness and why is it important? Well, interestingly enough, lots of um, animal studies have examined attractiveness, female attractiveness to males as a function of prenatal testosterone exposure. Um, so people have done this in animals such as mice, rabbits, um, and gerbils. And so those kind of animals, they develop in utero with many other animals. So you know they might have a litter of six or 10 um, offspring at once. And in that kind of setting, females will be exposed to different levels of testosterone depending on how close they are to males. So if they are gestating beside two males, they're exposed to more testosterone compared to a female that's beside one male or no males. And several of these studies have found that male mice or male rabbits or male gerbils find females to be more attractive if they were exposed to lower relative to higher levels of testosterone. So the females that were gestating beside females only and no males were preferentially selected as mates. And not only were they more attractive to their male counterparts, they also produced more offspring and offspring that weighed more. So this confirms the idea that attractiveness actually is communicating information about an individual's fertility and reproductive output. So all of this information um, is important in understanding this study about endometriosis and attractiveness. Because on the surface, it looks like, you know, we're just rating like, oh, is this woman with this disease hotter or not? And that seems like a really um, terrible and not useful study at all. And we also need to understand this in the context of gynecology and obstetrics. For years, women have um, been exploited 
um, abused, tortured in the context of those disciplines. I mean, gynecology, the person who's credited as being the father of gynecology performed experimental surgeries on black women who were enslaved. Um, and then those women also you know, had to help him in the clinic perform these surgeries. And um, they don't receive any credit for that participation. And they experienced like insane amounts of pain and suffering because of that forced participation. And Irish women as well were also subjected to really um, terrible experimentation in the early days of gynecology. And even still today, um, many women experience um, terrible treatment during pregnancy, labor, and childbirth. And as I said previously, women with endometriosis um, very frequently report that they feel not taken seriously by doctors and that they don't um, receive the treatment that they need to deal with their condition. So with that as the context, when a study like this comes out, um, it comes out as offensive, it's not received well, and it's painful for people who are affected um, to see that. So what I'm hoping to do is just contextualize the study a little bit, because as a scientist, I think it is okay to study attractiveness because it's a meaningful variable that communicates a lot. And when we are exploring things such as testosterone exposure and how that predicts other traits such as physical body shape, like fat deposits, um, um, body mass, um, and attractiveness, all those things are linked together. So it's not like attractiveness is this kind of floating, separate, purely cultural variable. But of course, attractiveness has its own history as um, being something that people are judged on. We know that people who are more attractive tend to be treated better, or given opportunities that people who are less attractive are not. But now, so we, now we have this information about low testosterone being important in the genesis of endometriosis. And this um, paper that was retracted can only really be understood when we look at a comparative context by understanding that the relationship between testosterone exposure, um, attractiveness, and other kinds of reproductive physiological variables that I haven't talked about yet today, um, that, they're, that they're all connected. So there's this um, similar processes going on across mammals and across females in terms of how they develop in the uterus and what kind of traits they manifest as adults. And so in terms of, you know, should studies like this be allowed? I think they should be allowed, but they need to be explained really well. You know, why is the researcher making this hypothesis? And another aspect of this study that um, comes out in the media is that the women were not aware that they were being judged by attractiveness. And um, so this study was passed by an ethics board, which means that the researchers have to in detail explain exactly what they're going to do. And a team of people say like, okay, this is ethical. We give you permission to do this study. Um, lots of studies do not fully inform participants of what they're going to do, because sometimes if your participant knows exactly what you're studying and why, uh, it could bias the results. So that, um, is what was going on in part in this study. So the women knew that they were going to have their bodies measured, so like their breasts and their waist, and they knew they were going to have their um, appearance evaluated in some way, but they didn't know it was going to be in the context of attractiveness, and they didn't know what the hypothesis was. Uh, so I think, in my opinion, based on what I've learned about this study, I think that some of the media may have exaggerated that aspect of it. And lots of women, once they learned about what was going to be measured, like such as age at sexual intercourse, uh, for sexual intercourse, they declined to participate. And that um, suggests that women had enough, uh, most of the women had felt like they had enough information to say, you know what, this study isn't for me and I'm not going to participate. And that's a key part of ethics and science is free and informed consent, is that you know what you're going to be asked to do and you get to decide beforehand if you're okay with it. And if you're uncomfortable at any part in the process, you can quit. So um, I think you know, that there was some minor issues with the study, but mainly in its justification and explanation, but that I also think it provides another clue to the puzzle of what causes endometriosis. And we can only understand that puzzle when we examine a lot of different variables and when we look at animals as well.
so often the human research and the animal research can, especially in a clinical setting, can develop in, in different pathways. So um, an evolutionary framework that sees attractiveness as a signal can be really powerful in, in illuminating um, what's going on. So um, one approach we've been looking at to understand endometriosis is that it may represent an extreme outcome of female typical development. So this one approach that my mentor um, and I work with is called the diametric disorders framework. And diametric means opposites. And so this framework is a way of understanding how disease risk evolves in humans and other animals. And the idea is that you can have a given trait or system or a gene or hormonal um, expression, and it can express very low or very high. So maybe you know, something can grow very quickly or grow slowly. Um, a gene can be expressed at a high amount or a low amount. And when you get to the extremes of low or high, small or large, early or late, fast or slow, you're more likely to get diseases. So things start to break down at their extremes. Mm -hmm. And so one way of understanding endometriosis might be that in early development, the low levels of testosterone relative to estrogen um, push female development toward this kind of um, extreme female expression. And then we get um, the expression of traits that we normally associate as female kind of turned up or expressed to an even higher degree. And as that happens, um, disease becomes more likely. So some examples, so we know like um, all women, their uterus is in constant motion. It's a smooth muscle and all the time it's contracting and how fast or slow it contracts as a function of sex hormones. And women with endometriosis, they have high levels of estrogen in their pelvic area, high levels of oxytocin, and their uterus contracts really um, quickly and a, and a little bit chaotically. So that's one example, you know, in a woman without the disease, um, their uterus is contracting at the say average rate and the women with endometriosis have like an, an extra high version of that trait. And there's a lot more information on this um, idea of endometriosis as a low testosterone condition. There's a lot more information about how endometriosis and PCOS connect. And hopefully I'll share that in future videos. But I just wanted to put this retracted study in context while also um, acknowledging what women with endometriosis go through in the clinical and research setting. So I think it's awesome that people at least have the voice to criticize science in public, but I think scientists, we have to have a responsibility to explain why a result for a study that may seem a bit problematic, why it may actually make sense in context. So I hope you enjoyed this video today. And if you like my stuff, um, consider liking, commenting, subscribing, or sharing. That would be great. Have an awesome day.